Coming up next on American Forum, we revisit our 2014 interview with historian Veshla Weaver as part of an ongoing special series on race relations in America. What now? In the wake of the events in Ferguson, Missouri and the debate and violence that has followed, what should Americans of goodwill be talking about today? We have seen the election of our first black president, the coming of age of a full generation of Americans born since passage of the Civil and Voting Rights Acts. Yet many of us feel that America no longer quite knows what to debate anymore. We don't understand the origins of the racial issues before us, and even less so, how to resolve them and begin moving forward. Join us now and in the weeks ahead as American Forum looks for a new dialogue and perhaps less predictable answers to the questions, what now? Where do we go from here? It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to the Miller Center's American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. For most Americans, criminal justice is something distant, a system built to protect the law abiding, punish law breakers, and ensure the civil and constitutional rights of the accused. Our guest today says that primary narrative of American history and values has become a hollow fairy tale. Veshla Weaver, an African American studies professor at Yale University, argues that the current American justice system has profoundly restructured the relationship between citizens and the state and created a new and growing category of second class citizens, a group defined less by actual misconduct than by race and poverty and that at a time when one in 30 adults is under the control of the judicial system and one third of all Americans have a criminal record, this development poses a grave threat to democracy. Veshla is the co-author with Amy Lerman of a provocative new book, Arresting Citizenship, which closely examines America's impulse to punish, control, and confine its citizens and argues that our justice system has come to contradict cornerstone notions of democracy, citizenship, and governance. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Doug. Yeah, it's really great to have you, and congratulations on the book. Thank you. You've written a book that is, on the one hand, very empirical and quantitative and has charts and a tremendous amount of data that, to bear out the arguments that you make, but it also has a great many human narratives of the people that you interviewed in the course of, of obtaining that, that data and understanding that debate. There were three young men in New Orleans whose names, at least as you present them in the book, were Renard, Xavier, and Reggie. Mm -hmm. Who were those young men and where do they fit into the story that you try to tell here? We met Renard and Reggie and Xavier uh, in New Orleans and when we sat down with them they were about 20, 21 years old. Um, only one of them had had a formal incarceration, uh, about a year behind bars, and then several years of probation on top of that. So when we sat down with them, um, we asked them just a simple question. Can you just describe government to us? What do you think of when you think of democracy? What do you think of when you think about your nation and your state? And what they described to us, and this is why I think it's very important for scholars to sit down with the people actually going through this system, rather than just dealing with the empirics and the charts and, you know, though of course we have that. Um, because what they revealed to us was not a system of democracy. It was not a system where they felt they had input in the governing institutions around them. It was a system where they felt, gov you know, government was meant not for the common good, not to re represent people like them, not to give them services, but to keep them in line. And they used that language. They described to me that the government, in their terms, they just used one word, uh, uh, was hard. I said, what do you mean by that? They said, well, you know, democracy don't get you a second chance. And what they described time and time again to me was that the government that they saw in their communities, in fact, one of them used the salt shakers on the table to map out their town. Here was the jail here was the police station, and here was the court. 
and, and they were literally hemmed in in this like Bermuda Triangle. And they all had uh, uh, very routine interactions with all three of those systems. That was government to them. To you and I, when we think of government, we think of city hall, we think of you know, elections, we think of getting our voices heard, we think of calling uh, 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 municipal services right, to fix something. We don't think of the jail, the police station, and the court. And yet, for men like Xavier, Renard, and Reggie, this is exactly what government is to them. This is the primary interface, the primary interaction they are having with representative democracy is through the institutions of criminal justice. Is it something about their behavior, the lives they lead, who they are, where they come from? Is it something about their conduct and their profile that makes them uh, encounter government so disproportionately in terms of law enforcement and justice? What we're increasingly seeing is that there's been a loosening of the relationship between criminal behavior, right, flouting the law, being running afoul of the law, and criminal justice contact. Those are not one and the same. And if you look at uh, uh, longitudinal studies of youth that follow youth through their cohort, what has occurred in, in the United States over time since about the late 1970s is that a greater proportion of citizens have contact with criminal justice that have actually never run afoul of the law. They've never done something criminal, but they're having contact. They're being stopped by police. So one of my uh, uh, colleagues, Jeff Fagan, finds that in New York City, um, the, the, the chance of uh, coming into contact with police, being stopped by police uh, involuntarily, for a black male 18 to 19 years old is 98%, right? Wow. 98% of black citizens are not committing crimes, okay? So what we've shown is that over time, through a variety of policy choices, uh, through a variety of broken windows policing tactics, we've expanded what we're calling the custodial population. Even as crime you know, wasn't necessarily rising, right? It peaks in 92 and then falls after, so they're not neatly tracking each other, incarceration and crime. And then coming back specifically to Renard and Xavier and Reggie, um, these were individuals growing up in a poor community, uh, high school dropouts, had very few uh, 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 options in the legal job market, okay? They had done low-level stuff, mis misdemeanors, um, some low-level marijuana in public view. Um, uh, uh, one of them had been jailed for possession of a firearm. But all of them, by age 12, okay, and every single person we interviewed in the book, their earliest encounter with the state, with the criminal justice state, was before the age of 15, okay? So uh, what they revealed to us was that maybe sometimes later on in their youth they had something that was more serious. But early on, they're, they're coming to know the criminal justice system in a way that white suburban youth are not, you know, they're, they're going to basketball games and they're going to high school and they're, you know, they're not being stopped by police. Um, so there's been this, this disassociation between the criminal population and the custodial population, and it's important to make that disaggregation because it's very easy to say, you know, well, you know, they've done bad things, right? Um, many people in their adolescence, and if you go back to this longitudinal study that I mentioned, 50% of the population reports doing something that could have landed them a misdemeanor or even a felony, right? But a very small percentage of that group is actually having criminal justice contact. If you look at the whole population of Americans, including everybody who's listening to you talk right now or watching this on television, 50% of us have actually done something we could have been arrested for that would have counted, Absolutely. something other than a speeding ticket. Absolutely. But, but it's only this microscopic or just single digit percentage of, of all of us who were ever who that's ever discovered or that we're ever arrested or anything happens, regardless of whether a person has done, ever actually done anything, if you're black, the likelihood is you have had some encounter with the criminal justice system. You've been accused, you've been questioned, you've been right. uh, at least arrested briefly um, uh, in, yeah. in some connection. Particularly for poor young black men in uh, urban loca locations. Okay, so one of the other interesting facts over time, people tend to see this, and I don't want to, you know, uh, make the, the story too simplistic. It's not just a black versus white phenomenon. It's a within black phenomenon. In other words, if you look over time, 
uh, uh, Bruce Western and others have shown us that upper class, affluent, highly educated, you know, college educated black men did not increase their share of imprisonment over time. Who increased their share of imprisonment over time was lowly educated, de-skilled, young, urban uh, black men. So it very much is a race and class story. It's low income, uneducated black men that are having this kind of contact. Now, we've had a lot of conversation in the, in the U.S. in the last few years about mass incarceration, and we, we sort of generally know uh, that there is this dilemma of the huge percentage of young African-American males in particular who are incarcerated or have been incarcerated. But you go beyond just documenting the, you, you argue that there's some consequence to that beyond just that it seems to be likely unfair. We've become an anti-democratic system, and I use that term very explicitly to mean um, if you hold up prisons and courts and police agencies up to the, the measures that we traditionally hold of other governing institutions up to, are they fair, are they accountable to the public, do they treat people equally, is there transparency, do citizens have voice in those institutions, prisons, police stations and courts time and time again fail, right? So we've set up a system that, ha that is operating under principles that don't govern our democracy. They're unequal, they're unaccountable, they're unfair, and they don't give citizens voice. Now let me make that a little bit more concrete, right? What do I mean by that? You can call an institution anti-democratic and that, you know, what does that actually mean in practice? To give you an example, if I go out and I'm stopped by police and uh, somebody uh, mishandles me or stops me unfairly, without enough evidence, without a cause. In most jurisdictions, I have absolutely no recourse to contest that stop. I can go into a police agency, I can uh, uh, make a complaint, usually nothing happens with those complaints, and in some cases, so in the case of Rodney King, for example, his brother went in the next day and made a complaint. Do you know what they did? They ran his, his name to see if he had any warrants on him. That is not being responsive and accountable to citizen input. Now, some may, might say, you know, it's, it's easy to say, well, why should we treat people democratically? These are, after all, criminals, though I've mentioned why that's not exactly right. These are, after all, you know, the criminal justice system, it's meant to deprive liberty. It's meant to be a place that doesn't have voice equality uh, and responsiveness. And, and Amy and I actually uh, really strongly argue that, no, that's not right. You can have effective crime control, you can deprive liberty for a period of time without operating anti-democratically. In fact, if you look at our own history or if you look at nations abroad, they often imprison, police, and surveil their communities without doing it anti-democratically. They still give citizens the ability to submit their grievances. They still give citizens the ability to be heard in the, in the, the process of their nation. They still are accountable to the public. They let the media come in and see their prisons. Prisons in the U.S. and, and police uh, 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 stations are vastly unaccountable to the, to the broader public and also to the citizens that are its wards. And we argue that that actually damages crime control in the long run because the citizens that live in communities where uh, uh, many, many people are being stopped unfairly, you, you know, forces used on them unfairly, what happens? They come to have uh, uh, what's called less legitimacy in the system. Well, if you don't feel that your state is accountable to you, when called upon, are you going to testify in a case? Are you going to serve as a witness? Are you going to call the police when you need help? No, and we found time and time again with the folks that we interviewed, they said, we won't call the cops if we were on our deathbed. We had people that had been hurt that would not call the police to aid them. That's a system that has lost legitimacy. It's the old notion of respect for the law. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. The, um, at the same time, though, we have had uh, a sort of tacit understanding in American life, uh, and it is most, uh, most canonized in popular media. Uh, but we, we have this sense 
that there are all these lawbreakers out there. We also have the sense that America is different from a lot of the other countries you're talking about, and it is different uh, demographically in, in key respects. We have always had a big, poor population. We have, because we have not been the kind of uh, social system uh, that eliminates poverty or eliminates some of the more difficult places, particularly in urban areas, uh, we, we have had a kind of diversity that is both negative and positive over time in terms of the behaviors of people. And we've had this tacit agreement that we're sort of counting on the police and the prosecutors to use their judgment, mm -hmm. sort these things out, that this young man that gets picked up uh, on a quarter somewhere, that while it may be the case that, uh, that the evidence against him for whatever he gets charged with that night is a little bit flimsy, but we count on that the police can be trusted right. to take a kid off the street who needs to be taken off the street. Maybe it's even good, good for the kid himself. So we, have the, we trust that a homicide detective that we see on Law and Order, that the techniques he uses to convince the bad guy to confess, uh, the, this, this, the, the terrible crimes like ones that we're very familiar with here today, um, uh, recently, uh, we kind of hope that the police will be able to extract the truth out of some character what, by whatever means. So the tacit agreement is that we, we accept that the system is trustworthy mm -hmm. and give it some latitude, uh, even if that sometimes that involves some things that are messy. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? During the 1970s, we actually removed a lot of discretion um, from judges. Um, we made the system procedurally more fair, right? You can no longer be beaten up, uh, though it happens, you can no longer be beaten up in a police station uh, and a co you know, confession uh, coerced from you. You can, uh, uh, um, uh, there are some safeguards that make sure that you're Mirandized, that you have your day in court, a jury of your peers, et cetera, et cetera. But what's happened over time is when we removed that discretion, what, what happened is we made everything procedurally more fair, but not necessarily more democratic, okay? We removed the discretion from one point in the system and put it to another point in the system. So police, for example, have enormous discretion in deciding who to stop, how to treat them, who to bring in, how, you know. Uh, prosecutors have enormous discretion in deciding who to charge, what evidence to bring, uh, 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 who gets a charge of, of felon versus misdemeanor. Um, and what that invites is it invites a system that is, you know, heavy on discretionary actions. These are, after all, human agents that make decisions. Um, and who tends to, to um, get charged and convicted and stopped using this discretion is, right, anyone's guess, poor young folks. Reform brings with it, uh, in fact, more injustice in a corollary kind of way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and those reforms, and I'll give you a speci another specific example, did not uh, make the system, they may have made it on the face more fair and more just, but they did not make it a system uh, that wasn't prone to error. So another example is the case of um, Adolph Lyons, who was stopped by police in LA uh, for, you know, something minor, a broken tail light. Um, and he was um, uh, uh, put in a chokehold after they asked him to, you know, uh, put his hands up and he reached for a wallet or something like that, right? He was put into a chokehold. He then passes out, defecates, uh, um, spits up blood. Later, he uh, uh, sues the LAPD and says, um, uh, I want to stop the practice of chokeholds uh, uh, by the LAPD. Right? And at that point in time, most of uh, the chokeholds that the LAPD was using were on uh, uh, black men. And most of the people that had died from chokeholds were black men. Okay? So the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court says, um, well, yes, you know, this was a, uh, an awful uh, chokehold, but you do not have standing. Again, consider what I said about uh, uh, citizens having voice into their institutions that regulate their daily lives. You do not have standing to sue and to enjoin the police from using the chokehold practice because you cannot demonstrate that they will use it on you at some point again in the future. This is why, what I mean by being able to hold our governing institutions accountable. Even if I am non-law abiding, I need the ability to hold my institutions accountable uh, uh, to my grievances 
if I am treated unfairly. Why has that happened? And maybe this goes beyond really the ground that you cover entirely in the book, but what's, what's your theory of why have we gone from uh, a period just 40 years ago when the Supreme Court revolutionized uh, the, the, the whole framework for how a person could be arrested and the things that had to happen to them, even though it hadn't been much many years before that, the Supreme Court had, had validated whipping people in prisons right. and you know, corp, you know, gross physical punishments of people were, were still authorized. But then we go through this period of radical change right. uh, that did bring an end to terrible deaths and abuse, particularly inside prisons. But how have we gone from that set of views to to one that seems so indifferent to the kinds of issues that, that you bring up? A few things. So you're right, we had this brief sort of um, opening up moment. We had a radical prisoner rights movement uh, that, that, that coalesced with the civil rights movement that brought some of the most arbitrary injustices in the prison system to light. Um, we had case after case uh, 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 of, of um, uh, procedural innovation. This is when we really get expansions in due process rights. At the same time, over time, those procedural uh, opening up, you know, had, have been chipped away at. Prison Litigation Reform Act passes, which basically removes access to the courts for prisoners who claim uh, mistreatment or abuse. Um, and puts incredible barriers on what they need to get over to bring uh, a suit um, in, the crimin in, in the system. So, for example, um, if I'm a prison inmate and I have uh, uh, um, uh, been abused or sodomized or something happens to me while I'm in that cell, and I want to bring a grievance and I want to sue the institution, I have to, in most jurisdictions, hand my grievance to the very officer that abused me, uh, um, I have to actually show physical injury, okay? So there have been cases where uh, guards, you know, uh, put cigarette butts out on somebody's arm, um, but because it didn't uh, result in a lasting injury or a scar, they didn't have standing. Well, in a democratic system, if I can't use the courts, then I can go vote, I can uh, contact my representative, I can get in touch with the media. If I'm a prisoner, the courts are almost my only avenue to have grievances heard. So if you take away the courts, you've basically taken away most of my democratic voice. I can't vote. I, most of the time, won't get access uh, to the media. I can't even write in a prison newspaper in some places, right? Prison newspapers have been largely shut down. Prison unions have been largely shut down over time. Um, though in the wake of the prisoner uh, rights movement, there were uh, hundreds uh, of newspapers and, and, and very organized prison unions operating around the country that often made prisons more safe, decent places, but also expansions in prosecutorial immunity. So that if the prosecutor in a case handles uh, uh, the evidence badly, um, so there's been cases of, you know, the prosecutor knows that the offender was a white man and they charge a black man instead, right? The, the, the defendant has almost no recourse because of wide prosecutorial immunity. You cannot bring uh, 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 civil charges against a prosecutor. Um, and police enjoy, enjoy uh, qualified immunity. It means that these agents in our government, and they are governing institutions, are not accountable to the public. They can operate with wide discretion, and they have immunity. They cannot be held to account. Let me play devil's advocate with you for a moment, though. If we back up and we look again at why did this happen, how did this happen, you go back to 1970 or thereabouts, mm -hmm. and you have this sense in the country at the time that a crime is skyrocketing, which it was, uh, and continue to for another 20 years. Uh, there's the sense that this new scourge of drugs and behaviors that go with it has become a huge problem in the minds of most Americans. There's also a real sense that that really bad people are getting away with more and more bad things mm -hmm. and the technicalities mm -hmm. are getting them off and the police are handcuffed, they don't have enough guns, they, there aren't enough of them, they're overwhelmed. Uh, and so over in response to this, this very existential threat perceived by many Americans, there begin to be all of these changes in the law to make it uh, more difficult for right. people to get out right. of things. And 
much more grave penalties if you are a repeat offender. Three strikes, you're out, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. One of the most remarkable things to me about that whole period, all the way up into the 1990s, uh, is that if you look at the public opinion surveys, those are things that are overwhelmingly supported by Americans, including African Americans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You go into the, Attorney General Holder has told me stories of going into housing projects uh, when he was a U.S. attorney uh, in Washington, D.C., and talking about diversion programs and having folks there say, well, that's all fine, but first you should arrest all those kids mm -hmm. out, on, mm -hmm. out on my stoop and get them mm -hmm. out of here. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in some respects, one could make the case yeah. that the problems you're identifying are outgrowths of reasonable responses mm -hmm. to a national crisis. The reasonable response went too far. So, um, and you're absolutely right. So I'll start first with your question of, well, blacks themselves often support uh, um, uh, aggressive handling uh, of people. 60% of the people in the surveys that we used had also been victimized, often before they were justice involved, okay? So it's not the, the old narrative of like, you know, the white victim and, and the black predator. These are, black communities face rates of predatory violence that are absolutely an epidemic. They do not want crime a, any more than, than, than uh, safe white communities. They want communities that are safe, that are decent, uh, where they can walk down the street without fear of their life. However, they also, if you look at public opinion surveys, they also want to be treated fairly uh, by the police. They want the police to have a presence, but they don't want to be, uh, 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 have force used on them um, when they're not uh, an offender. So I think it's important to recognize that it's not this like, you know, democratic impulse. Look, we had this rising crime rate, people were scared. Um, we had a moment where it seemed like uh, uh, things had gone too far the other way and then we cracked down, you know. Um, people were asking for things that would make their communities safe and they didn't get them. A big part of why we saw the militarized police force out in Ferguson has to do with a program that many people forget but that was absolutely one of the biggest, fastest growing agencies in the federal government. It's called the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration and it dispersed billions of dollars in federal funding with almost no strings attached to localities with outdated uh, uh, and sort of parochial police forces. What happens, what transpires across the course of the decade from 1970 to 1982, the life course of the agency, is that police agencies receive tanks, armored tanks, they receive bulletproof vests, they receive billions of dollars in funding. And they do what anybody does when they get uh, uh, more money, right? They build up infrastructure. That's another way that we went too far. So it's not just that we passed uh, uh, more and more habitual offender laws, you mentioned three strikes. It's also that we gave uh, police forces the tools for incredible manpower and incredible amounts of police surveillance. And when you said Ferguson, obviously you were referring to the, the, the killing of this young man, African-American man in Ferguson, Missouri, Michael Brown, and, right. the, and the events that followed that, and this very militarized force, mm -hmm. that, uh, a police force that was seen there. Um, how big a problem, though, is it for the police to have sufficient firepower to deal with the situation? I know that in the debate around that, people were alarmed. Uh, to see these tank-like things and all these guys looking like they were the army. And we do have this tradition in America that the military doesn't engage in police. And to, so the, to see the police looking like and behaving like the military, that's part of why it's disturbing to us. On the other hand, there were a lot of police officers and a lot of wives and husbands of police officers who said, what are you people saying? You know, they shouldn't have enough guns. You know, mm -hmm. this is easy to say at this moment, but when my husband is dead uh, after some incident in which he's been overwhelmed, then mm -hmm. you know, don't, don't, don't talk to me about too, many, too much firepower in the hands mm -hmm. of the police then. I mean, I'll come back to the book and to the communities that we spoke with. People feel, right, and one of the arguments we make is that, um, you know, the police are not a separate arm of government. They are part of our American government, right? The criminal justice system is part of our democracy. And so we should be interested and concerned with what citizens learn through their interactions with that arm of government. And what they learn is what we call custodial citizenship. 
they learn that the police are not there to protect them, the police are there to keep them in line and to harm them. They learn that they are not citizens with equal voice worthy of concern and respect. They learn the anti-democratic aspects of these institutions, and it's reflected in the anti-democratic aspects of this clientele. So I'll give you an example. Many mundane behaviors that I, you and I probably take for granted, walking down the street carrying a bag, having friends over to our house. Uh, uh, Sarah said to me, um, oh no, you can't, you can't have friends over, because if the police see that too many people are coming to your house, they automatically think you're selling drugs and you're gonna have a police force uh, at your house, so I just avoid having friends over. Okay, what is this teaching people in these communities about their standing in society, about their ability to engage in the behaviors that you and I take for granted. I had other people, I had one guy who sticks out in my mind, Charles, because he actually was one of these folks that said, oh no, the police treated me fairly, I like the police, I'm glad that we have the police to protect. And then I said, um, yeah, so um, uh, uh, you think the police are fair, um, that's great, and he said, and you know, you just gotta do certain things. Like, for example, I never ride around in the car with more than two. I said, more than two? He said, more than two black people. That's, that's pretty much like, that's illegal, right? That's, that's the system. They're learning anti-democratic lessons about what things they can and cannot do. I'll give you other examples. Uh, uh, we had people that said to us, um, um, well, I, I don't walk this certain way, and so I take an hour to get home because I go the long way around. Because if police see me walking through this area after work, doesn't matter what, I, uh, you know, what I'm on my way to do, doesn't matter that I've come from work and I'm wearing uh, a, a, a uniform, I'm gonna get stopped. So I add on an hour to my trip just so that I can avoid that kind of interaction. And the three boys that I talked about uh, that I began the book with, Renard, Xavier, and Reggie, um, they said, oh yeah, if you, if you come ride through, through our neighborhood right now and you're in our car, we're gonna get stopped. They're gonna think that, that a drug deal is going on. Why? Because you're racially incongruous. You don't belong in this neighborhood with us. So something's going down, right? These are not the kinds of lessons that inspire democratic citizenship. The, the further thing that happens is, because we went into this thinking, well, people don't participate in political life when they have this kind of interaction because they've been formally disenfranchised by felon disenfranchisement. You mean they can't vote? Right, they can't vote. Actually, no, it's much deeper than that. They don't, they don't vote, they don't participate in any sphere of government. They don't get involved in civic associations. They don't call uh, uh, 311, which is a service for, you know, getting you know, your city government to fix your street lights, because they fear police interaction. They don't feel like voluntary participants in our democracy, they feel like involuntary subjects. So the best thing for them to do, and I had many people, probably the majority of the folks that I interviewed, tell me, oh no, 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 you gotta stay below the radar. You gotta keep a low profile, I find a way of mailing in my check to the court when I have to pay a fee rather than going in because if I go in there, they're gonna find something else to lock me up for. I need to keep my distance from government, I need to stay below the radar, I need to keep a low profile, I need to keep my head down. I mean, these were the, again and again and again, this kind of vocabulary that you don't find in middle class white suburban neighborhoods. This idea of being invisible. It's a politics of invisibility. You must be you know, uh, uh, absent from government because if you show your face too much, they're gonna think you're doing something. Would you put it that way or is this something that's more an unfortunate derivative of a series of things that have gone too far or designed to essentially create a replacement for the Jim Crow legal system that was there to, mm -hmm. uh, to suppress black aspiration and black uh, mm -hmm. opportunities mm -hmm. in another era? At the end of, of Reconstruction, 
uh, you get this massive effort to arrest and confine. I mean, your book shows this, uh, and the convict leasing system springs up. In the collapse of the ghetto that happens in, in the 1970s, you get this effort to then confine. How this country tends to deal with poor, disadvantaged, marginal, pariah people is not through expansions in welfare, is not through uh, expansions in suffrage, uh, uh, through, bringing, through, through widening the polity, widening the inclusiveness. The way we often deal with the poor is through control, right? Through social control, um, uh, you know, so some would say that deindustrialization played a role in this, right? You get massive increase in black joblessness in the city during the 1970s as a result of a move from a goods producing economy to a service producing economy. Blacks are left in concentrated areas of poverty. What happens then is the criminal justice system takes over, right? We, uh, um, and, and often I think the police in this story are treated a bit unfairly. Because after all, and I have many police that, that we came into contact with through this book, um, they are given the tools only to arrest and confine. They are not meant to handle all manner of social ills in this country. We don't respond to social problems happening in poor areas the way we probably should have. It wasn't random that the people that were going to suffer the most and be stopped and policed and arrested and surveilled and sent to prison were going to be the people that were the, the, the fallout from the war on poverty, right? This, this, it's not, it's not a, we, sh we shouldn't be surprised. It's not a mystery um, that that was the group that was going to be targeted. Um, you know, a lot of folks that we interviewed, they said to us, look, I didn't have a choice. And they said, you know, look, I, I had child support payments climbing up, climbing up. I'm thinking about Bert specifically. He had just been released from prison for five years. And he said, and I really felt like a man. I was providing for my family. I went out and I, was, I, I sold drugs and these, these court costs and the, the, the child support payments had been stacking up, stacking up, stacking up, but I was on top of everything. And then I got uh, uh, hit with this uh, uh, conviction, but I wouldn't have done it any differently because I was going to jail one way or another. I'm paraphrasing him. Uh, he said because I was either going to jail for not being able to, to pay my child support because I couldn't get a legal job, or I was going to jail for, for selling drugs, but at least I protected my family and provided for them during that time. So a lot of people that we interviewed were extremely uh, marginal. They were at the margins of uh, 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 the labor force. Um, they had inconsistent work histories. They often found, I had one woman who, she broke my heart because she only had a misdemeanor and she couldn't get a job at CVS. Right? She had a misdemeanor on her record and she couldn't get a job. And so she was homeless and pregnant at the time. And, uh, um, you know, uh, that was her situation. So a lot of times, you know, we don't consider that there's this other half. We talk about con criminal justice, but it's also the state of the, the, the peril of poverty in these communities. And the, and, and the democratization of poverty, I take it, because per, these, these sorts of things do begin, there, there are more white people and other kinds of folks who are not necessarily African American vulnerable to falling into poverty now, and, right. and some of these, some of these uh, terrible outcomes begin to extend across a, a more diverse array of very poor people. Uh, I think that the data bears that out. Yeah. But it, it's, it's fascinating, and so far into middle class years, to our bourgeois years, this idea of a, of a, that, that engaging in criminal behavior and selling drugs is in effect for certain people the pursuit of the American dream and actually showing responsibility right. and mas classic masculine notions of taking care of your family. That's a really foreign concept, but the idea that, that in, within a certain group of people or an individual's mind that that's really preferable and that that's a more attractive right. figure in a community than a lazy guy who's living off the government, this other classic caricature stereotype that, right. that middle class people get worked up about. Mm -hmm. Which is better, in a sense, the guy who actually is working hard at an illegal thing or the guy who's not working hard at all? Absolutely. Uh, uh, that, that's, that's really fascinating. Yeah. When you're faced with somebody who was locked up for four days for using a curse word, 
it, it's sort of while she was pregnant, um, <laughs> and and it's just it 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 blows my mind. It's just what part of effective crime control do we get out of that? Instead, we're creating the very population that we're trying not to, right? And we're creating deep suspicion, deep distrust in communities where what we need is these communities to be trusting and involved and involved with their civic groups and calling the police when they need help. Yeah, well, your book, and that very point, and the number of places in the book I couldn't help but <clears throat> sort of took me back uh, 20 years ago to a time when I was a police reporter for a big metro newspaper and I, at the height of the drug war, and I spent a lot of time. It was a, a, a great thing to do, always a great story, was to work it out to go out with the police on a big drug raid. But I remember a particular night in Atlanta being with this group of a uh, sort of suburban police agency that was particularly excited about uh, this very military style operation and lots of people involved and everybody in, uh, in bulletproof vests and big guns and, and, uh, and, and ramrods to knock down doors, all about this one apartment that had been identified by an undercover agent and then this huge team of people come charging in in the middle of the night, knock down the door of this apartment, burst into what is going to be this this drug kingpin's headquarters, and it's the living room of a grandmother uh, mm -hmm. and and her husband. Mm -hmm. uh, that and on the walls there are photographs of all the grandkids who mm -hmm. and in their high school graduation gowns. Uh, it, it is a classic lower middle class uh, uh, elderly family's apartment, mm -hmm. but they have a 16 year old grandson mm -hmm. who's living in a bedroom in the back. And he had sold drugs to someone in a fairly inconsequential transaction. Mm -hmm. And that's what had led to this scene of a 70-year-old woman and her 75-year-old mm -hmm. husband handcuffed yeah. and on the floor in the living room of their apartment. Right. Right. I have to confess, that was the moment that I, I began to say, okay, maybe there really is something uh, amiss right. in where all of this is going. Right. And that kind of interaction is surprisingly common. This has become such a ubiquitous aspect of low-income black neighborhoods and low-income black men that it's actually become part and parcel of the experience of being from one of those neighborhoods. So we have this this gigantic surge in arrests in America and incarceration and I think the general numbers are that that the so from the first half of the 20th century into the 1970s, there are mm -hmm. generally about 100,000 to 200,000 right. people imprisoned at all times. It a little yeah, moves around a little bit, but that's about where the numbers are. And then you get to around 1980, it's gotten up to about 300,000 people are in the system. And then this gigantic thing occurs. And we go from, over the course of a little more than, but right at 30 years, we go from 300,000 to 1.6 million people are in the system. Right. It's gigantic And that's just surge. on one day, any given day. Exactly. If you were to actually look at everybody who passes everybody through. Everybody who passes through across their life course. Millions and millions. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's how you end up with this number of that, uh, that 5% of all people of, of all young, by a young adult that have been incarcerated, 25% yep. of- 25% have been arrested. Have been arrested, mm -hmm. yeah. So these huge numbers, which again, sound very far into middle class years. Yep. You know, I don't, the, in the world that I live in, a quarter of all the people I know have not been arrested, 5% right. of right. them, you know. The, now, I'll confess, yeah. I know something about the criminal justice system. I was, I, I'm not as pure as driven snow. You know, I made some mistakes when I was a young man. My first, thing, my first knowledge of the police came from uh, being on the wrong side of that equation. Uh, and so I, I have some sense of, the, mm -hmm. of that, how those things happen. But my life was not uh, completely derailed right. by those events. Right. And, but, but the point I actually wanted to get at though, we've, we had this gigantic surge in arrests. Mm -hmm. But now it's going down. Right. You know, it has been going down for some years. Now, it's still very high, but the number's going down, uh, particularly the number of African-American males is going down. And simultaneously, the group of Americans whose incarceration rates are going up the fastest are women, and I think white women specifically. Mm -hmm. so, so black males- From a very low base. From though. very low base, yeah. exactly. So it's a statistical anomaly, but still, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, so, and I believe the explanation for the white women element is that in some respects, a group who were buffered in some respects in the past from actually facing the penalties for, for actions that they took. Now, because the system's been reformed mm -hmm. and must be right. more uh, right. equally applied, uh, so a young woman who gets mixed up in drugs is more likely to yeah. actually have the penalty mm -hmm. imposed on her. Uh, but, but at the same time, we have the, 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 the big numbers of African-American men are going down. So is the, is the problem fixing itself? 
Okay, so yes and no. I'm a little bit uh, less optimistic maybe, um, partly for a number of reasons. So the first reason is the BGS, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, just released a report showing that actually the rate of incarceration is now in the last year not going down. Um, uh, so we had a brief couple years moment where it looked like we were at sort of a tipping point. Part of that is we just got so you know, high up there that the, the, it, it, there's sort of not a surplus population to imprison anymore, right? So it had to kind of reach a tipping point. Um, uh, but the other reason I'm a little bit less optimistic is that a lot of that movement, if you look state by state, um, was a result of, um, uh, so for example, California. California passed what was called realignment. And they were under court order. Their prisons had gotten so packed and overcrowded and ballooning at the seams that they needed to uh, uh, reduce their population. And the court gave them a timetable and said, you've got to do this. They passed realignment. What that did is it basically emptied the prisons a little bit and sent those people to local jails. Why am I less optimistic about that? Because in our interviews, having jail contact is not necessarily better. Moving people from prison systems to probation or community corrections is not necessarily a better system. In fact, uh, Renard even told me, he said, look, I took the year in prison. They offered me 10 years probation, and they, that's just giving me 10 years to, to, uh, to mess up. You know, 10 years for them to find some little something. I'm, I'm, I have a felon in the car with me. I'm associating with a felon. I'm going to take the year. So it's, it's not necessarily the case that moving people to probation and parole or probation in local jails is any less of a correctional system. That's still, they're still learning some of the same things. Now, it's a little bit better, maybe, you know. Uh, uh, they have more freedom of movement. Um, they can get jobs and such. Um, but when you move people to probation and parole, um, the requirements of probation and parole are things that, like, it would be hard for anybody uh, to comply with. Like what? Like, you know, you can't uh, 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 go to another city, right? So if you've got to visit family in another city, you've got to get uh, uh, some, in most systems, in most jurisdictions, you've got to get approval for that. You can't, now, again, these are neighborhoods where, you know, a lot of the folks we interviewed, they said to me, 85% of their known you know, family members, church members, friends had some sort of record. You can't be associating with somebody with a record. So it makes life very difficult. Yeah. You need to get a job in a certain amount of time. Well, who's hiring felons? Okay, is UVA hiring felons? Um, so it's, it, life becomes very precarious in another set of ways. Um, so we would argue that moving people from, from one system to another system within the same system, you're just fiddling with the numbers. You're not really reforming the system. And a lot of these things you're talking about, like the probation system, increasingly are problematic in their own ways. I mean, right. these are private contractors. People are going to see uh, that the probation uh, officers actually have a vested interest in extending probation as long yeah. as possible because they get paid every time someone comes to visit. People go back to prison for not being able to pay the fees associated. I mean, it does begin to sound a lot like some of the things yeah. that, that my research was about from 100 yeah. years ago yeah. where people ended Absolutely. up you know, re-enslaved. But... Uh, all very problematic things. Um, how did you get so interested in this? Two reasons. I spent a summer in Montgomery, Alabama uh, with inmate mothers. Um, uh, I was working for the Southern Poverty Law Center, but I happened to uh, volunteer at this prison uh, for women. And uh, I noticed that the children were traveling from 100 miles away to visit their loved ones. Many of the people that were incarcerated were incarcerated for um, being attached to somebody that was selling drugs, writing a bad check, uh, uh, sometimes even reckless driving. I mean, it just low level things. Not to say that those things aren't bad. Um, and I got interested in it there. Um, the second, uh, and I actually ended up donating my car when I left Montgomery to one of the inmates, um, because you'd be surprised, um, even where I, where I live now, New Haven, Connecticut, there's almost nothing given to people when they leave the system. Um, you know, literally, they're, they're given, you know, a couple dollars, and when they're not on probation and parole, 
they have almost no aid to get a job, to navigate life on the outside, to get re reunited with their families, um, to begin knowing their children again. Um, there's very little. And so um, when I made it to grad school, I started to notice, and I'm a political scientist, I went to a political science program, and I now teach in a political science department. Why is it that political scientists do not see this as a major way that the state, that our government is interacting with poor communities? This is a central face of the state to many poor communities. This is government. We had people tell us, oh, um, the government, you know, like when, I, when, I, when we asked them, what's government to you? Oh, the criminal justice system, you know, the sheriff, the police, the mayor, you know, I mean, it was just, odd. Would you ever describe government in those terms? And so um, I started my main intervention uh, with Amy was to say, look, this, we got to the system through explicit policy choices. Those policy choices impact people's lives in political ways. And people learn citizenship. They learn about their state. They learn about their standing as citizens. They learn about their worth. They learn about equality through the criminal justice system. And in many ways, they, they, um, they, learn, they unlearn citizenship. They unlearn democratic citizenship. So I just, I felt like it was an area where we just, we were treating it as like this side system. This is government more than the welfare state for some of these communities. The carceral state is what they're seeing. A few months ago, uh, Attorney General Holder sat in the same chair that you were in, and I, I talked to him about some of these same things. And uh, I pointed out to him that he and, and President Obama both have talked a lot about mass incarceration, expressed very clearly, sincerely, their concern about how the, where the system has ended up. But I said to to Attorney General Holder, I said, but at the same time, you're, you're still the mass incarcerator in chief. Uh, and it wasn't long after that that, uh, in fact, that day, uh, he, he announced, and then later President Obama announced some more efforts to uh, relax some of the early release guidelines mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a what has turned into, I think, a fairly substantial effort to reexamine some <laughs> of these issues has been underway. Mm -hmm. But is that the solution? Is, is that the direction? Is enough being done? And if not, what is the solution? You know, I was thinking about the solution this morning. The solution is to not do what we're doing now. <laughs> That's effectively, it, 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 it's to just, it, it, first of all, we need massive sentencing reform and not just at the federal level, right? Most of the criminal justice system is not federal prisons. It's at the state level. It's at the local, local level, local jails, county jails. So we need to relax uh, uh, some of the uh, very harsh sentencing guidelines, habitual offender laws. We need one of the best things that we can do, and if Eric Holder were sitting here, maybe I'd tell this to him, is to immediately cut the funding. Federal grants gave rise to this behemoth. Cut the grants. It's very difficult, right? Once you build a prison, they will come. Right? Once you build a prison, once those beds are there, they will be filled. I've never heard of a prison that was at like 30% you know, capacity. Okay, So cut the funding. The system will decrease on its own. Okay? And this is what a lot of the right on crime folks, right? there's this great bipartisan uh, coalition uh, forming between hardline conservatives who are now seeing that this is a major and very expensive way to deal with crime. Like Rand Paul, Senator from Kentucky. Absolutely. Okay? The whole Rand, right on crime initiative is about you know, we need to scale back, like, pretty radically. It's not just going to be tweaking one drug law, right? It's great. I applaud the fact that we retroactively, you know, uh, 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 eliminated the, um, or close to eliminated, the crack cocaine sentencing disparity, but there's many sentencing disparities. There are many laws on the books that give people a hard criminal record for something that 30 years ago would have been dealt with through citation, okay? Would have been dealt with through a fine. So we need to massively reduce, but I would not stop there, okay? So incarceration is one piece of the puzzle. The other, the, the other piece, and though we have much less good statistics on this, is the huge increase in police stops over time, the huge increase in misdemeanor convictions. It is very easy to churn out uh, uh, misdemeanor con uh, convictions, and prosecutors have almost no incentive not, not to charge them. They're very easy to get through. 
So it's also on these sort of lesser, more mundane aspects that we need to stop feeding the system, not stop growing the system. I mean, if you look at New York, 600,000 people being stopped by police in a year? Though at the same time, those numbers were skyrocketing, and those incarceration numbers for the whole country were skyrocketing. Crime rates did turn right. and then began to fall precipitously. Is there no possibility that those things are related? Virtually every social scientist that I know finds that the link between crime rates and incarceration is a very messy one. They do not track each other neatly, okay? Partly because the way we punish is not simply a function of crime, right? You can have crime and decide to deal with it in other ways. Um, so I would say we're at a very good window of opportunity. Crime rates are low, though they're still staggeringly high um, in some areas. We still do need to protect people uh, from violent harm. Um, but now is a good moment to begin revisiting the system because we are at uh, uh, the safest point that we've been for a long time. Well, thank you for being here. It's an important book. Thank you so much, Doug. The book is Arresting Citizenship by Bechelor Reader. Thank you.